Well, good morning. I am Carson Jump, and uh, I get to speak to you this morning. If you're visiting this morning, I want to tell you this, is I'm not the pastor, and uh, so if you come back next Sunday, you get a better message and a better preaching and a better example of what Cross Point can bring. And this is my last Sunday and my family's last Sunday here at Cross Point, so you can also talk bad about me next Sunday, and I won't know. Uh, so it could be both ways. Man, did you hear that guy last week? Um, no, so just, just to give a little bit about myself and my family and where we're going and uh, get that out of the way and then we'll get into the word. Um, so my family and I will be moving here at the end of May and we're going down to Fort Moore, Georgia, which was Fort Benning, Georgia, which probably doesn't mean a lot to you or Air Force folks or po- folks from Sumter, but uh, yeah, that's right. It's, a, it's definitely an army post, right? Um, so we're, we're moving there. Uh, and for those that are here, I am a chaplain in the Army uh, and have been a chaplain for 15 years and have been a chaplain my entire time in the military. Um, and the reason I say that is because for the last two years, my job here has been a little bit different. And sometimes people have said, you're not really a chaplain. And I would argue I am I'm just doing things a little bit different. And so the last two years have been kind of a respite for me and for my family uh, where I'm not getting up and preaching once a month or a couple times a month or uh, on sometimes where it's that rotation where we're serving. Uh, we've had the, the privilege of serving here in Cross Point and, and being able to do things like that, but a respite in the sense of being able just to, to receive the word personally, uh, but then even for my family uh, to receive the love and admiration where they're not the family that's looked at to as the chaplain's family. They're just looked at as the jump family. And so I know from, from my perspective, and I believe for my, my families as well, we've enjoyed being able to connect to a local church that we've not been able to do in the past and really to be plugged in and be loved on. Uh, and so thank you very much for, for, for doing that for us. Second thing I want to say in reference to that is that when we got here in June of almost two years ago, um, we, I don't think Amy and I looked at churches necessarily. Hayden is the one that went online and said, hey, I found this church that's close to the house. Let's go try it out. And was like, okay, let's go. Uh, and we, we came the first Sunday and we loved it. And here's what I would tell you. We knew we'd only be here two years. Uh, and you probably only have six months here, maybe two years, maybe four years. Um, get involved, become a member, and plug in. Uh, because the time goes by fast. And whether it's six months or two years or five years, uh, there's lost time that you may have if you don't plug in. And so I just encourage those that haven't and you're make, trying to make that decision is to do it. Okay, so we're going to get to the text in just a second. One more last thing in regards to graduation. For those that are graduating, I just want you to, 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 to take this nugget, and as we walk through the passage today, we're going to talk about the growing years of our Messiah, of, of Jesus, who came and walked on the earth. We're going to talk about his growing time and his graduation. So for the adults in the room, adulting is hard, yes. right? It is. It's, adulting is hard. Um, And so for the graduates, as you're now becoming adults and uh, going to be adulting and learning, uh, your faith and your walk with Jesus needs to be personal. And it needs to be something that you grab a hold on to. It's no longer your parents. It's no longer your churches. It's yours. And you've got to be grounded in that. And so when we see the spiritual growth and just the the physical growth of our Messiah, of Jesus here this morning, we're going to see that there's dedication, there's time that needs to be placed there, um, and there's there's an emphasis that needs to be there. So I just want to make sure that our graduates are being mentioned. You guys have already been honored, uh, but I want to remind you, make the faith your own uh, as you go out into this world. Okay, so this morning we're going to be talking about the son's man, son of man's growing years. Now, Luke is very uh, specific on presenting Jesus as the son of man. And so we're going to see that in this passage where Jesus is presented as the son of man, having to come fully human and having to endure things just like we would uh, as our, our human flesh in today. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 52. Uh, Tim gave me a large portion of scripture, so uh, hopefully a crock pot isn't going to boil over or a stove going to burn the chicken. No, I'm just joking. Here's our big idea for this morning. Uh, Our spiritual growth in stature and wisdom affects our horizontal and vertical relationships. Our spiritual growth in stature and wisdom affects our vertical and horizontal relationships. 
Vertical being our relationship with God, horizontal being our relationships that we have with one another. Wow, it got dark. You can't take notes now. Uh, <laughs> makes it easier, though. I don't think I'm talking to anybody. Um, that vertical and horizontal. When you are in a stagnant place spiritually, your relationship with God is being stunted and is not being able to grow. And at the same time, your relationship with your spouse and your children and your neighbors are all going to be affected. So here, our spiritual growth and stature and wisdom affects our vertical and horizontal relationships. Our key verse is verse 52. And this is what it says. It says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So Jesus, we see him in, we'll see it in his child, young years, to when he's 12 years old, and we're just given a small glimpse, and Luke does a good job of giving us just a small glimpse of his childhood, the only place that we really see it uh, in Scripture. Um, and it says at the end that Jesus grew in stature, and I'm sure that was in physical sense, but I believe that there was also a spiritual, as much as he was the Son of God and the Son of Man could grow. But he also grew in favor with God and with man. And so I just want you to think of that, of as we are pursuing and looking here, is where is it that we can grow spiritually? Because I believe that each one of us can. I know I can. There's places that I'm going to need to submit. There's places that I need to relinquish control. There's places that I need to wait on the Lord. And, and in these moments here is to say, I need to grow in these areas. So, so how do we spiritually grow? We said what the, the big idea was. What's, how do we spiritually grow in stature and wisdom? I'm glad you asked that question. And so we're going to look at three different ways that I think are highlighted in the text today. So let's look at Luke chapter 21 through verses 23 to begin. Uh, verses, uh, Luke chapter 2, 21 through 23. It says, And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time had came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Uh, In verse 23 it says, And it is written the law of the Lord, Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Uh, In verse 24, And to offer the sacrifice according to what is said in the law uh, of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So Joseph and Mary, we find them here after the, the nativity scene there in Bethlehem, finding uh, their way eight days to then fulfill the law of circumcising Jesus, uh, and circumcising the baby, and then naming him Jesus. They're both happening at the same time. So in verse 21, we see this circumcision. Back with Abraham, God had given this uh, element of practice with, to Abraham that they would need to circumcise each one of their male children. More specifically, we see in the law where it's eight days, and you can do some studies there uh, in regards to the timing, but God knows when certain chemicals and certain makeup of a body is the best time uh, to circumcise. Uh, Abraham being circumcised as an amel uh, would have a much different picture in a different painful situation than for a child at this age. What I want to point out for Joseph and Mary is here in this circumcision, they are following the law. They knew the Torah, as many of the, 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 the Jewish people would, and so they look at it, and they don't see, like, oh, this is the Messiah, this is the Son of God, he doesn't need to be circumcised, right? Like, they don't, they don't even, even, even consider that. They see it as, he is our son. We've been told that the, the males go, and they're circumcised, and this is what they do. Uh, this is a connection of the seed of Abraham. He's made under the law, as we're seeing in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. He's the one that's to come to, come to fulfill the law. And so here we see this first element that is given under the law that circumcision was to take place and that the Son of Man is is now having to go under that same um, procedure. The Son of Man is given the name Jesus, the name that was given to them by the angel prior to the baby being born. And this was typical that after circumcision in the eight days is when you would name the child. Um, And some of you may have done that where you held on until like the last day before you left the hospital, that then's when you give the name as opposed to maybe having it chosen beforehand or right when they come out. But here, given the name Jesus, what does the name Jesus mean? Well, Jesus was the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Jeshua, Joshua, the one that's to bring salvation. Jesus during that time was a common name. It was almost like John is today or Matthew or 
well, I'm using all biblical names. It's a, uh, what's another one that's out there? Yeah, well, I don't know, maybe Carson, Amy, whatever the name would have been used, right? Um, it was a common name during that time. And so Jesus is specifically named and given this name, Jeshua, the one that's going to bring the salvation, which is just wonderful because not only will we see in just a second when he's taken to the temple, um, but this name means so much more because he is the Christ, the one that is coming to take away the sin of the world. And so the Son of Man is given the name of Jesus, and he is the one that is going to bring salvation. Um, Second is, in, in regards to the, the formal practice, is the purification. So after eight days, uh, for a lady or for a woman, after she would give birth, she would have to wait a certain time to then go up to the temple to then be purified. For a male, it was 40 days. Uh, for a uh, girl, it was like 80 days. It was, it was twice the amount of time uh, as far as the waiting to be purified. So here we have a male, right, Jesus, was born, eight days circumcision, and then about 33 days after the circumcision, on or about 40 days, they would go up to the temple. So here we see Jesus, Joseph and Mary, again, following the law that was given to them from Leviticus and from Numbers, um, to go up to the temple to present the firstborn son, to present him back to the Lord, um, and then we'll talk about a sacrifice in a second. But they went there for the purification of Mary as, a, as well as Jesus. Both of these acts, circumcision and purification, were reminders to the participants, that being Joseph and Mary, and should be reminders to us today of the taint of sin and the uncleanness. See, it was important that Jesus was 100% man, and so that there's the taint of sin that is upon him that has no effect, and there's the uncleanness that he had to stand in in our place so that he can go to the cross so that he can go and to die for us and to provide salvation. So both of these acts point towards the taint of sin and the uncleanness. Jesus identifies with sinful mankind. Luke is presenting Jesus as the son of man, 100% man, so that he can be the sacrifice for us and for the world. The next piece in verse 24, we see that there's the redemption of the firstborn. There's the, to, the buyback of the firstborn. Um, and this was for the firstborn of everything, to include cattle and such. If you go back to Leviticus and Numbers, you can see that. But here, Joseph and Mary takes them to the temple, and they have to do a sacrifice. They bring these pigeons uh, to the temple to be sacrificed, and this is them buying back their son from the Lord. Because you know why? They understood that their child was from God. Parents, do we recognize that our children are a blessing, not just a blessing, but they are a gift to us, and yet they are 100% theirs. And we're given the opportunity uh, to steward that time with them. Joseph and Mary here recognize not only the Levitical law that they needed to buy back the firstborn, but they recognize very deeply and intimately that Jesus is the Son of God, and Luke is pointing out that he is the Son of Man here. So we see this practice of buying back the child from, uh, from God. Mary and Joseph, they do it through turtle doves or young pigeons. Oftentimes it would be a lamb if you had money, but obviously we see that Mary and Joseph did not have much money, and so they would actually have used this as their sacrifice. So number one in regards to verses 21 through 24 is that we grow spiritually uh, when we do in stature and wisdom when we submit to the word of God. When we, by submitting to the word of God. We were driving this last Monday from um, just the, the regional airport, or the small, not regional, the small little airport in Sumter. Um, our kids do Civil Air Patrol, um, and it's always a tag-off between me and Amy on who picks them up because it's after 9 o'clock, and 9 o'clock is our bedtime. <laughs> so if I fall asleep first, she's going, if, you know, vice versa, or we're kicking each other out of the bed like, oh, no, you need to get up and go. Um, anyway, so I picked up the kids, I'm driving back, and as I'm driving by, we're on Beckwith Road, and so it's just a two-lane road, and we're driving there, and several cars had come by, and Caleb s says this to me, he's like, Dad, what is it with these lights? How can you s not, like, what is, it's so blinding, uh, in re reference to the cars coming this way. And so the next car that came through, 
uh, I was very intentional. Beforehand, I was just doing it naturally. But this time, I was very intentional that as the light was coming closer was just to continue to look at the road and not be affected by the light. And he's talking, it's blinding my eyes. How do you not look? And so, you know, I, I told him that, hey, I just focus on the road. Now, that's as spiritual as I got at the moment. But 45 minutes later, I go to his room after we gotten home, and I said, hey, Caleb, this is a good reminder. Of there's distractions, there's sin, there's things of the world that are going to grab your attention. But we need to submit and stay focused on the word of God. Amen. And so here, Joseph and Mary are helping Jesus to grow in stature and in wisdom by taking actions as parents of submitting to the word of God. Our second point that we see in verses 25 through 24 or 25 through 40 is by waiting on God's movement. So let's read through this passage and we'll walk through each verse uh, because I think it's really important to see the two characters or individuals that are uh, talked about here. So in verse 25 through 40, did I say what the point was? By waiting on God's movement. Okay, good. Uh, verse 25 through 40. So, now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit, and he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus uh, to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and he blessed God saying, and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For your eyes have seen your salvation they have prepared in, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of, for revelation in the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon uh, Bless them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rising of many in Israel, and for the sign that is opposed uh, and the sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that, thoughts, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanil, in the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him uh, to all that were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. So here, our second point of waiting on God's movement, verses 25 through 40. We see that Simeon was a righteous man uh, that the scripture tells us. And here for a certain amount of time, he had been waiting for the coming of the Messiah. He was waiting on the consolation of Israel. He was waiting uh, upon that one that was going to come in and redeem the people. And he had been told by the Holy Spirit in, in a way that he was going to be able to see that child before dying. Uh, and so you could just imagine as he would go to the temple each time and not knowing when that time was going to be. In verse 26, God told him that he would not see death until, he was until the Christ had come. And Simeon was moved by the Holy Spirit to come to the temple the day that Jesus was presented. So there's a couple movements, a couple um, connections with the Holy Spirit here. All right, first off is with Simeon. Uh, and, and it is first seen that the Holy Spirit was upon him. All right, we see that the Holy Spirit was upon Simeon. And then the Holy Spirit speaks to Simeon, and then the Holy Spirit moves him to go to the temple. You see somebody that is yielded to the Holy Spirit. He was a righteous man, one that wasn't grieving the Holy Spirit, that wasn't quenching the Holy Spirit. See, when we are not waiting on God's movement and we get distracted by the other things that are going on in life, we start to grieve the Holy Spirit, we start to quench the Holy Spirit, and we no longer hear his voice. We pick up his word and it becomes very void and it just becomes a brick where these words don't jump off the page and doesn't speak to me uh, because I have now become kind of deaf or I have become deaf to what God is wanting to speak to me. But Simeon here, we see that he's faithful 
um, and that he is able to then be moved by the Holy Spirit to be at the temple at the very moment that Jesus is there. Now, I don't know how often it is for you, but sometimes when I look at Scripture, I think of a desert place where there's just, you know, a very simple place that people can gather. I want you to think back to, if you've been to Israel, great, I have not been there, to Jerusalem. Uh, I want you just to think of a metropolis town, although it, it is Middle East and it is desert and it is, uh, you know, rustic in its way. Um, but you've got a town that's then got houses and it's got all of its development and then you've got a temple. And even the temple itself has multiple rooms, multiple places, right, that you could go. And so there's no, no telling that Simeon would go to the same place every time to look for Jesus, right? So the fact that the Holy Spirit says, Simeon, go on to the temple. You're going to see the, 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 the Christ today. You're going to see Jesus today. And that Jesus ends up going there on the same day that Joseph and Mary are obeying and submitting to God's law and going to present him at the temple that they meet. I just, I want to highlight, this is a miraculous event that's taking place. There's some miraculous events that happen in your life, and sometimes we don't recognize it. You're in the right place, the right time, seeing the right person. And God uses that. But sometimes we're blinded to that. But here Simeon is, is, is presented with an opportunity. He moves with the Holy Spirit. He goes to the temple, and here he sees Jesus, the one that now he can hold in his hands. And so we see that in verse 28. Simeon takes Jesus into his arms. See, he was told by the Holy Spirit that he would see Jesus. Man, can you imagine? Not only does he get to see, but he gets to hold the Son of God in his hands. Simeon blesses God while holding Jesus. I just make this comment, and I don't know if it will go anywhere with you, maybe just something flat, but um, when we pray, we bless the food. And I wonder if we should change that terminology to, I'm going to bless God. Because Simeon here, he's, he's blessing God for what was promised to him. I don't know that we can bless the food to be any better than what it was prepared to be. And I don't know that God wants us to do that. And I know this is a sidetrack piece, but um, I think that we need to have a better practice of blessing the Lord. Where we're recognizing the goodness that he brings into our life and that the sustenance that he brings to us physically, spiritually, emotionally, and in every capacity way, that we need to bless the Lord. So Simeon here, he blesses God while holding Jesus in his hands. And you can see the prayer that he says here. He says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. Wow, what a blessing. Simeon was not just saying, hey, Israel's going to be redeemed. He's talking about the world. He's, he's, he's like, the Gentiles included here is the salvation that Jesus is bringing here, is going to bring. So before we move on uh, from Simeon, I just want to, to note, Simeon, he was filled by the Holy Spirit. God spoke through the Holy Spirit to him, and he was moved by the Holy Spirit to go to the temple. He's a great example of what it means to be waiting on God's movement, to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. Now in verse 33, we see Joseph and Mary's response. It's of marvel. Wow. They, they, they've seen the angel. They've actually experienced the birth of Jesus. Um, and then they go to the temple and Simeon, right? They, you know, just imagine. If you were, you know, just imagine here, you know, you come into to Cross Point. And uh, you thought, hey, I'm just going to sit in the back and not be noticed, and nobody's going to even see that I came or gone. Uh, and Tim, up here, says, Carson and Amy, it's so, I'm so glad you're here. So glad you guys can come here for the first Sunday. Right? And th th just a completely recognition of our entire family on our first Sunday, not expecting it, not wanting it, and kind of like shocked and marveled that something would be said. Now, to put that on a grand scheme of Mary and Joseph are coming into the temple thinking they're just following the law. They're just coming to do what God had told them to do, to bring and present Jesus. And they had no idea that presenting Jesus here in this moment, which they may have experienced with family in other ways, was going to be an opportunity that their son, their human son, who is the son of God, is going to be lifted up and exalted, saying, he is the one that is coming. And this man, who is old in age, 
has been waiting since the, the Holy Spirit had told him, you will see him before you die. And now he blesses the Lord and says, I can die now. I mean, Scripture doesn't say how many years he lived, but we could imagine that it may have been very soon after that Simeon went, past, you know, went, went to, 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 to be with God. But the message that he had of the gospel that he's presenting about Jesus, that it's for the Gentile and for the Jew, oh, it's an important message that's beginning just at the beginning of, God, of, of his uh, life, not having the change in the Acts into Paul's time, right? Verse 34 through 35, we see Simeon blesses them. They bl he blesses Mary, particularly Mary. Uh, some of the wording, you could look at it and think, okay, he's only talking to Mary and not Joseph, and that's believed because Joseph did not, uh, he died earlier in Jesus' life, um, and so he was not there when Jesus went to the cross. He did probably not see his ministry, but Mary did. Mary saw her son rejected and opposed by the religious leaders and by others, and Mary saw her son uh, lifted up on a cross, dying as he was, um, came to do. I, I'm going to skip to a, a, uh, just a thought for a second. Have you ever had uh, your kids say yes, no, yes, no questions? Are you, are you familiar with these? Okay, if not, let me, let me tell you, and then if you're a child, don't use this with your parents, okay, so don't get these ideas. If they want to do something, They'll come and ask us. Before asking us what they want to do, they'll say, hey, Dad, yes or no? Um, yes or no to what? Uh, and, and it's kind of a, you know, I, I hate it. I, I do. I despise it, boys and girls. <laughs> but they ask the yes or no questions. Uh, and so sometimes I'll say yes, and, the, you know, and they'll be like, okay, yes, we can have ice cream. No, okay. Uh, I thought we were talking about vacuuming. You know, like um, <laughs> they manipulate it. Um, here, I just want to point out that that waiting for the Holy Spirit to move, we can manipulate it. Yes or no, God. I'm only going to do this if it's a yes or no, I, if it's in my favor. And if it's not going to be in my favor, I'm going to manipulate it to change it so it is. You know? But when we're waiting on God's movement, it should be open arms and saying, whatever you have for me, Lord. Amen. And Simeon, whew, he had experienced that for years. And to be able to see and, and, and go. Our next character, a lady, uh, Anna, a prophetess. Luke does a good job of presenting women and, and highlights them in Scripture. He does that both in Luke and in Acts, showing that women were part of the ministry of Jesus and they were a vital portion of the writing of, the, of Scripture and being part of there with Jesus. And so here, uh, Simeon highlights in Luke chapter 2 where Anna the prophetess um, she, it's interesting, he also highlights where Simeon, we don't know anything about him, Anna, we know a lot about, because Luke took the time to tell us who, were her, who was her family, what was her lineage, where did she come from. Uh, she's been a widow for 84 years, and then she was married with her husband for about seven years, and if you do some math, she's probably over 100 years old. And she is dedicated coming to the temple, fasting and prayer, praying every day. I think you could argue, and I read this in a few commentaries, that Anna was one of the first ones to preach the gospel by her response. When it says in verse 38, And coming up at that hour, very hour, she gave thanks to God and to speak to him, all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. She, you know that song where we were saying, go out to the mountains and proclaim? I mean, I, I, I can imagine Anna as a hundred-year-old woman in whatever way that she can, she is proclaiming that good news that the Messiah has come. Just the child. And at this point, recognize Jesus is only 40 days years old. He's just a baby. And yet they're prophesying over him what he's going to do for his ministry and what he's going to do when he goes to the cross and when he is resurrected and brings the salvation to his people in a much different way than they thought. They thought it was a physical uh, um, uh, salvation that was going to come, but no, it was a spiritual and a changing of the heart. Uh, and so Anna, we see that she's older. Uh, and so she preaches the good news of the coming of the Messiah. We said that in verse 38. Verse 39 and 40, we see that Joseph and, and Mary, uh, they returned uh, Jesus to Nazareth. 
Now, so there, there's a little bit of a gap here, and I, I want to just not highlight it, but recognize it. Luke does a good job of talking about his, Jesus' birth. He talks about the circumcision and the purification, so that first 40 days. Um, and then he talks about them going back to Nazareth. What is a kind of a gap, and we find it in another synoptic gospel, gospel of Matthew, is that Jesus would have gone back to Bethlehem, most likely, uh, and the Magi would have come. Then there would have been the, uh, the warning that Herod is going to come and kill all the babies, so you need to leave and go to Egypt. Uh, and they would have traveled down to Egypt, and then they would have traveled back up to Nazareth. Luke presents it as after the 40 days of being at Jerusalem that they traveled back to Nazareth, and there's some gaps that we can find from Matthew on some of those other pieces of his childhood. Nonetheless, he brings us back to where they would have returned to Nazareth out of Egypt. Right? And so we talked about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, if you know from the story, right? they end up in Egypt, and they come out of Egypt, Right? They're called out of Egypt, and so we've already seen some of those connections that are there. So point number two we've already made mention of is that we are spiritually growing in stature and wisdom by um, waiting on the movement of God, waiting on his movement, waiting on God to move. The third one is by releasing control to Jesus. <clears throat> and this is in verses 41 through 52. So if we'll read through this, these verses here, and then we'll begin to talk as well. Verse 41 says, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to according to his custom. And when the feast had ended, they, came, they were returning. The boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with man. So we do this by releasing control. We look at these verses here. Joseph and Mary, again, um, show that they're following the law. And really more so than probably the average uh, citizen of Israel, where they were going to Jerusalem for the Passover. Uh, there was a requirement every so often for that to happen, but it looked like they were going above and beyond. This was not Jesus' first time to Jerusalem for the Passover. Um, it would have been consecutive, whether that was, you know, once they got back to Nazareth and he was two or three or four, uh, and then every year until he was 12 and beyond. Um, but here, Jesus has gone to, pass, to Passover. The difference, probably from when he was 11 years old being there at Passover and now 12, is that Jewish law sees the 12-year-old as one that can participate in Passover. They can actually come and partake in the festivities. It was not as much as when you're 13, but it gave a, like it was like a half or something, like they could fast half of the time, whereas when you became 13, you could fast and be part of the feasting the entire time. So Jesus, this is a great opportunity where they bring him there. And so now Jesus is 12, and this is really his first participation. Other times he would have just hung out with the children wherever they were hanging out in children's church uh, while they were doing the Passover meal. Um, but most children could be playing, playing outside in the temple with the other children, you know, staying busy, probably trying to keep out of trouble. Uh, but now he's, he's 12 and he can participate. So this is a seven-day feast. And this seven-day feast even happens today, right? We just had Passover. Um, it was right at the same week as our Easter uh, Sunday, uh, that, as far as when Passover happened for the Jewish uh, folks. Passover celebrates God's deliverance out of Egypt. It's looking back at the plagues and what was brought onto Egypt and how that uh, the, the firstborn of those that had the blood on their doorpost, right? The Holy Spirit passed over them, and their child was safe. And all those that were not were killed, which is, you know, just sounds merciless, and it is. But that is what moved the heart of Pharaoh 
to let the Israelites go. And so this Passover celebrates the deliverance that God had for those in Egypt. <clears throat> the feast ends, we see that in verse 43, and Jesus' parents leave, but Jesus stayed in Jerusalem. Okay, if you're a parent in here, or maybe just as a child, have you left your kids or have you been left? No, never? Okay, I'm just the bad parent. We're just the bad parents, Amy. Uh, just an example. I don't remember when it was, but we were here at Cross Point, um, and all of the kids, we thought they were going outside, and um, we get in the car, and we're driving away, and we're going down the road just by the, uh, the nursing home, and at that moment, it's like, where's David? <laughs> and uh, we had forgotten David. And now David tells the story a little bit different. He says, Dad, I told you I was going to the bathroom. Um, and I says, I don't remember you saying that. Um, but we all have those stories of either being left or, being, or, or leaving somebody. Here, Mary and Joseph, uh, to put it in context, it wasn't just driving two or three minutes down the road. It was traveling an entire day to your hometown, uh, recognizing that he's not there, and then traveling a whole day back Still not seeing him or knowing where he's at, and then spending an entire day looking for him in Jerusalem. Three days, Scripture says. Um, I don't know what that would do to your heart, but I know that what that would do to Amy's heart, um, and that would put me in a lot of trouble. Uh, and so I don't know what the conversations would be between Mary and Joseph, that opportunity for them to engage and to talk through it. Um, but. When they get back to Jerusalem, they go to the temple and they find Jesus. They find him there listening and asking questions. Just, you know, here, he's the 12-year-old. Not even able to fully participate in Passover, right? But now he's like, he's, he's like one of the religious leaders, asking the questions, listening, and doing some of the teaching. His parents, in verse 48, they were astonished. Mary says, son, why did you treat us so? Uh, behold, your father and I have been searching for you with great distress. Again, we see the heart of a parent wanting to know where their ch child is. And if you were back in that time on that 40th day of his life, and he's being lifted up and blessed by Simeon as being the one that's going to save the world, and then 12 years later, you're the one that fails because you lost him, um, there's a lot of responsibility that were on those parents, uh, on Mary and on, and on Joseph. They didn't understand. They didn't understand Jesus' response in 49 when he says, why are you looking for me? Did you not know I need to be in my father's house? They did not understand it. And interesting enough, Luke emphasizes again, and I think this probably is, is where we can see that Mary uh, most likely had a first account with Luke being able to retell her story uh, of saying, hey, this is how I remember it. I remember it when Simeon lifted Jesus up. I remember it when... I treasured all these things in my heart. This is the second time that in this chapter that Luke identifies Mary treasuring all of these things in her heart. You see that in verse 19, and then you see it here in verse 51, where after all these accounts that Mary is treasuring this up in her heart. It meant a lot to her, uh, and she most likely, this would have been after Jesus has raised and most likely left earth, that she's recounting this and telling this to Luke, and you can see the treasure and how she had stored that. Okay, so let's end with our key verse for this text that shows us how our vertical and horizontal relationships are affected by our spiritual growth and stature and wisdom. And that being verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Now, you're not Jesus. I'm not Jesus. We don't even pretend to be Jesus. What we are is followers of Jesus. We are supposed to pick up our cross and follow him, right? We are supposed to be followers of him doing as he did. Interesting enough, the disciples, when they were reading, writing these epistles, when they were referencing back to the word of God, what word of God were they referencing to? The Torah, right? If they were writing to a church in Thessalonica and they said, you know, you need to be following God's word, they were referencing the Torah. They were referencing the things that they had been taught as a child. What we hold as an entire word of God, they only had a portion of, but it was enough because it talks about Jesus to reveal the one that had come, and then you connect the letters that they're writing, and you've got the full counsel of the Lord here. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature 
because of some actions that his parents did, right? That they submitted to the word of God. We can see that Simeon, right, the, the spiritual growth that's there, and for Anna, where they were waiting, waiting for the movement of God. They weren't moving any further, and they wouldn't, were, were not doubting when it wasn't happening on their timeline. And then the last, we see that it was releasing. Mary and Joseph needed to release control of Jesus. There's a lot of us here this morning that we just need to release control of someone of something, some idea that is just holding us back because we've not released it to Jesus. We still want to control it within our earthly means and manners. So with the response and application, what are areas in your life, in your heart, do you need to submit to God? So I'd say now, but we're not going to have the time to do it, so I really would be more sometime this week or later today. This application and response would be for you just to take time to examine what is it in your heart, in your life, that you need to allow God to convict you of, to reveal that you're, holding, that you're not submitting to in his word. Remember, Joseph and Mary, their submission in following God's law, we can't pick and choose what part we like and what we don't, what we're going to hold to, what we're going to obey, what we're going to listen to, right? It's submitting to it all. So what areas in your life and heart do you need to submit to God? The second question is, where do you need to wait and trust God to move or to influence? Look into your life and see how you might be grieving or how you might be quenching the Holy Spirit in your life right now. Are you yielded to the Holy Spirit? Are you expecting God to move and influence your life? Remember Simeon who was yielded and filled with the Holy Spirit, and Anna, who was dedicated herself to fasting and prayer. Their motivation is not to do, but it was to be and to know the God that they loved. And then the last question or application here is, who, what, or where do you need to release control to Jesus? Releasing to Jesus is a step to finding him in a more deeply and intimate way. Remember Joseph and Mary, right? Searching Jerusalem all along the road. Did he fall? Is it in a hole? Did he fall down this rock when he was climbing? Because my kids would do that all the time when we go hiking, right? They're up on a tree. Did he get left behind? No, they, they released control, and when they came back, they found him in the temple. And while they didn't understand and they were astonished, their response was, this, we see this is Jesus. And for Mary to look back, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. For her to be able to look back and think, oh, wow, okay, this, this makes sense now. I was supposed to release to God. I, I was the caretaker, but really, Jesus was, was, was there and I needed to release to him. Um, so what, what, what an exercise of releasing control they would have. And then the last two things that's already written on it, so I won't read through it, is I would ask you just to pray in prayer. Ask these questions. What ways am I not submitting to you, God? In what ways do I need to release control to Jesus? And in what ways do I need to wait on you, Lord? It's not a yes, no. no not, not asking to get an answer so I know what it's going to look like or to know, you know, manipulate it. It's a, God, where do I need to wait on you? And then I would ask you that you confess this. Some of you are in discipleship groups, alongside groups. You have Sunday school. You have friends and family that when God reveals this to you, confess it. James 5.16 says that that power of confessing to one another, it brings unity. And you will find that when you confess things that are in your heart, yes, it's good to confess it to God, but confess it to a brother or sister in Christ, and you will find some freedom, spiritual freedom, freedom that brings to growth that can happen for you today. So with that, I just want to ask you to pray. And when you think about what Jesus, just as a child, right? And I, was, I, I, you guys get to walk through the rest of Luke uh, with Tim and to see his ministry as it begins and to look back. But even in his childhood, we can, child growing years, we can see the work of God happening. We can see the salvation just as just a baby that he was presented, the one that was going to be lifted up. And I think in the song that was saying uh, of talking about every knee is going to bow, Simeon lifted up Jesus as a baby. Anna praised God for Jesus as a baby. 
We sing together to praise God, but what I want to just hone in on, there's areas of your heart and your life that you're not. And so I ask you, pray about that, confess it, and then those will be the steps for our spiritual growth to continue. Will you pray with me? God, I I thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. You're a gracious and ever-loving God. God, I pray that those that are here this morning, to include myself, that those uh, rooms or areas of our hearts and of our life that we have tucked away, uh, we have not given you access or others access to, God, I pray that those bonds, that those, um, those shackles would just fall off, God, and we would just confess it so that we can spiritually grow, so that we can be agents of your grace and of your love and of your gospel. So God, I pray that you bring conviction over our hearts and over our lives. And God, that you would also fill us with your love to know that there's nothing we can do that would get us too much further from your grace. And we're not any more justified now than we were when we were saved. And we can't be any more justified. But God, we can be more sanctified. And so God, I pray that we would uh, yield to you and that through the Holy Spirit, you would work in our heart and mind today. And this week, we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.